I now have great pleasure in inviting Lord May to present the Lord Lewis Prize Lecture entitled Science Advice and Policy Making. Well, it really is a great pleasure and privilege to give the inaugural such lecture which so properly recognises the many contributions that Jack Lewis made and continues to make uh, both to chemistry and to science policy making. It's also rather interesting for me in that the fact that I'm here is in no small measure due to a chemistry teacher I had in high school who taught um, at the state grammar school I went to no fewer than eight fellows of the Royal Society, including John Cornforth, who would be the most distinguished of the lot. Um, and my subsequent career wandered round, uh, but has come back on this evening to chemistry. And I'm sure that if Lenny Basser were still around, he would be very pleased to know. I'm going to talk, of course, about science advice and policy making. I begin with the observation that the attribute which primarily distinguishes us from the wonderful diversity of other species with which we share our planet is our self-conscious quest for understanding the world around us and our place in it. I mean, the first stirrings of this are lost in the mists of magic and mysticism. Enigmatic traces remain in Stonehenge and the caves in Altamira and such places. But since then, advancing fitfully often two steps forward, one step back, sometimes two steps back, one step forward, this intellectual adventure has become ever more systematically organised, ever more systematically experimental, particularly over the past three centuries or so. And it's still accelerating so that we have learned more in the past 50 years about the world around us than in all of previous history. And I have little doubt we're going to learn more again over the next 50 years. And we've applied this understanding of the external world in ways which without question have made life better in both the developed and the developing world. Lifespans, for example, at birth on the planet 50 years ago, life expectancy was 46 years, today it's 64. Over the last 35 years, we've doubled food production on only 10% more land. And the average inhabitant of the globe, with great variability among different places, the average inhabitant subsidizes daily activities with external energy inputs that amount to 14 times the amount of energy you need to maintain basic metabolic processes, which is all our hunter-gatherer ancestors had. But at the turn of the century, we increasingly are recognising the unintended adverse consequences of these well-intended actions. Better health in both the developed and the developing world means population growth unprecedented and still continuing. The Green Revolution in Agriculture has had and is having serious environmental consequences that were not foreseen. And the thing that is most prominent on current agendas but really is only one among many interlocking problems is the fossil fuel energy subsidies we take for granted which indeed vary hugely among, uh, among countries, are changing the global climate. And as if that weren't enough, the century that's just begun is going to see our understanding of the external world reaching down into the molecular machinery of life itself, and I believe that is going to pose for us conundrums of what use we make of it, that are really going to make today look like a curtain raiser. So it's against this background that I want to share 
some reflections on how we might do a better, more deliberately questioning, more deliberately looking ahead job of asking what kind of tomorrow we want to build with the possibilities that science opens for us, subject always to the constraints which science clarifies, rather than just letting things happen. And of course one of the biggest problems is that all too often we're not really sure of what the possible benefits are, and we're even less sure of what the countervailing worries might be. I mean, sometimes, as for example, xenotransplantation, the worries are about safety. Would putting pig's hearts in people create some new plague? In other instances, much of the debate is about ethical issues. The debate on embryonic stem cell research would be one such. And for yet others, for example, the debate about GM crops in this country, there are questions both about safety, will it create super weeds, and about ethics. Should we care about reductions in biological diversity that might come about, or even more mystically, uh, might we feel it's unnatural in some sense, with natural all too often defined as how it was when we were young. And very often, the problems are the problems that we don't even yet foresee. As a century ago, despite a few flickers of forewarning, climate change was. And I think it's Science Week or Science Engineering Technology Week in an acronym. And when I'm talking about science today, I wish to emphasize, as I always am when I use the word science, I am using it in the conventional embracing sense of science, medicine, engineering, and the social sciences. On the Holborn Viaduct, there are four iconic statues symbolising the four pillars of Victorian society. Commerce, arts, agriculture and science, each holding an iconic object. And what is the science lady holding? She's holding Watts Governor, canonical engineering artefact. The engineer... The, the engineers of the Victorian age didn't have these insecurities that prompt complex acronyms in place of words that the public simply understands as meaning a more embracing quantity. But there we are. So in what follows, I'm going to try to sketch some ideal precepts to guide us through this moral maze so that uh, along the lines of what we need to be doing. Harder to deal with, but I will turn to that toward the end, are some of the shadows that fall between such ideal precepts and execution. And I will end with uh, some occasionally perhaps tactless anecdotes from my own experience or observation in recent years. But before turning to that task, I'm going to sketch three preliminary misunderstandings of, at the interface between, as it were, science and, as it were, society. The first two of them being misunderstandings by the science community, frequently, about this peculiar and multifaceted in entity which is so often and so glibly called the public, but which is many-faceted and ultimately defies definition. And the third of which, science is often uncertain, is indeed often a misunderstanding of the public about science. So I'm going to do this pretty quickly. The first of these, distrust of the new, is not new. And you can make your own catalogue. There's a, one small suggestion. In fact, disapproval or worries about science these days are expressed in considerably less draconian times than they were until relatively recently. And lest we think that uh, Frankenstein foods, vaccination, when it first appeared 200 years ago, caused riots in the streets. And this cartoon with uh, cows popping out of people's arms clearly captures a public sense of uh, Frankenstein vaccinations, although they wouldn't have called it that because Mary Shelley hadn't written Frankenstein yet. 
And there was a recrudescence of that about 100 years ago when public health came in and threatened to overturn quack doctors. 